want to first thank all of you for coming out on this day, this early, to hear an old bald guy talk about some philosophical musings I've been thinking a lot about lately. I want to thank Richard and the uh, whole team that he's put together here. It's incredible, this conference every year. My ability to be here as part of it is, is a treasure. And, um, the greatest lineup of speakers. Since I've been to every one of these, I can say this is the greatest lineup of speakers I've ever put together. And um, I look forward to it. I wish I could stay all day. Anyhow, I think reciprocity is that term that uh, Robin Wall Kimmer has in her book, Braiding Sweetgrass. And I thought it would be a good topic to kick this year off with. If you haven't read that book, you need to buy it and read it. I don't think there's any more important ecological book written since San County Almanac than this one. It had a huge impact on me personally and the way I look at things. So I wanted to talk about this in the framework of sustainable landscapes because it ties together, I think, in a really important way. So, you have to define reciprocity, you guys can read, right? <laughs> and so I'm not going to read this whole thing. But it is this concept, an important concept that um, we exchange things. You know, we give back for what we get. And um, the Native Americans, at least in this part of the world, uh, understood that really well. You know, we took what we needed, but we gave back. And we only took what we needed. We didn't take things more than we needed at the moment so that we could make a profit on them. We took what we needed to sustain ourselves, and we celebrated that in an almost religious kind of way. And when we look at the world around us as this gift given to us, but not to us alone, um, it changes the way we look at our own landscapes, I think, and the need to preserve what is here naturally. And so that's how I'm coaching this. And I don't expect you to read all this either. We have gifts, and I think that's the most important part of this slide. When you're given a gift, I hope we all grow up with the idea that we say thank you in some way. We give something back, even if it's a thank you, or if it's an emotion, if it's a uh, gift we feel we've got to give you something back instead. That's not really the way this is set up, isn't it? It's our thankfulness. We've just gone through this whole uh, season of giving thanks and then giving presents. Probably you're all of some uh, ilk that gives presents during the holidays. Um, we understand what this whole idea of gift giving is. I hope it's not giving things because you have to or trying to see how many dollars you spent on me, I'm going to spend more on you kind of thing. It's this joy of the fact that I care about this thing, you've given me something, I care for you because of that. You know, the way we look at the earth, so to speak, as that, I think, changes our framework for landscaping with native plants for wildlife. At least it has for me. In a climate of sufficiency, our hunger for more uh, abates and we take only what we need. I think I've already said that. We look at the world around us, and in Florida, I've been here for about 37 years now, it's hard to believe. You know, and see the changes. I drive down. Uh, Highway 54 in Pasco County, and almost everything I passed was not there when I moved here 35 years ago. And the pasture lands and the open spaces that are there will be housing developments in, or some kind of commercial shopping center in the next five years. I just know it is. The road went from two lanes to three lanes going each direction, so I guess that's a six lane road now. And even then, the traffic is unbelievably bad. We are so attuned in our culture to take more than we need instead of only what we need and then to thank whatever it is we thank for what we've been given and 
and still a desire to give back at least as much as what we take. When I taught botany at, at uh, St. Pete College for the years I did, I like to tease my students. I like to tease people. If you know me, you know that. I respect you if you give me shit back. Excuse me. <laughs> That's me take. I'll bleep that out later. <laughs> I do respect vegetarians. When it's brought about from whatever concept it comes from. But if it's because plants don't have feelings, and I can kill you, but that's okay. I don't want to kill an animal because it's going to suffer, and it's true. But you know, when you throw that, that uh, raw green bean into a boiling pot of water, those little baby beans are screaming to death. You just don't hear them. When I read Robin's book, it brought that home to me even more that, you know, things give their lives to give us ours. And so by reciprocity, we give back after we've killed the green bean, the lima bean, the soybean, or that chicken breast. I have put in bold, I think, the part that's important from Robin's work in this talk that she gave here. The earth and the natural world, it supports our all animal, animate beings, excuse me. You know, the interesting thing is that Native Americans, at least in the cultures that I've read, and I'm certainly not a Native American expert, I never proposed that I am. You know, they didn't call inanimate things it. <coughs> They called them, just like we would call each other, he and she, they were real beings, and they weren't something that was put here as um, something for us to use, for example. But they all had their own souls. Even the rocks and soil and the rest had their own souls. And so when we use them, we are using something that has some kind of spirit. And that's that power of language she talks about, because if we start looking at the world around us and all the things that share this earth that for a great many years we have assumed dominion over, like they were here for us to use, instead of part of this incredible fabric of life that we are blessed to be a part of, not more so or less so, but integrated into this whole matrix, we look at that thing, we start understanding that all of these things have their own desires, lives that they're trying to proceed with, their own um, importance. And so, love of the land, giving back to it. I think the most important part for me in, in this book that I am basing the rest of this lecture on is the importance of gratitude and mutuality. What I, I think kind of said, that it's our obligation and to the land and to each other, and not just to us, but to each other, this whole living world that we're a part of, this covenant of reciprocity. The gratitude that we have that we're part of it, the gratitude we have for what's given to us by the natural world, and our desire to give something back. And we looked at this native plant movement for wildlife, and I will probably say this more than once. It's not, I don't think, you know, I used to, I have been talking for years. And you may feel like I've already done that this morning. <laughs> but this idea that it's somehow, we're landscaping for wildlife and there is a benefit to us. There's a health benefit, we know there is. You know, our psyche when we're connected to nature uh, improves our health. There are so many sociological studies that show that. It helps, and I see this posted where it helps our property values because if we landscape in such a way 
it uh, in, we put this tree instead of that tree. We landscape this way instead of just a, you know, I have so many neighbors that have just graveled their yards because I guess they've given up on the real world completely. <laughs> <laughs> There's all these reasons that we give that somehow are humanistic, anthropocentric, whatever it may be, that is somehow good for us. And the real reason we should be doing it is because we're giving back to the real world and we are somehow acknowledging that we're part of this and that our role in nature is to have to take certain things to survive, but our role is also to perhaps give back something for that. And so that mutual well-being of the land and the people dependent upon this reciprocity. Constant source of renewing gifts. You know, we're sitting here in winter, but back in the botanical gardens where I'm at, my strawberry plants are making strawberries, and my all these things are starting to give back to us, and it's great, and we look forward to the strawberry festival, and we look forward to this, and we look forward to that. Eventually we'll get oranges, eventually they'll solve the citrus greeny thing, and we'll have oranges again. But we get these gifts that I don't think we often really acknowledge deep inside what that really means. So, Robin's quote here, not mine, of course, and I'll let you read that while I talk, drone on aimlessly, whatever it might be that I'm doing right now. Um, the restoration of damaged ecosystems, I think, you know, is a big part of what I bet a bunch of you are involved in one way or another. I know Audubon is in this area in Vero Beach. I know that Audubon and Sierra Club and all kinds of Native Plant Society, et cetera, groups are working towards restoring things, and that's all part of this movement, these damaged systems that we're somehow giving back. And that really, I think, is the crux of this whole uh, conference, the Native Plant Movement, etc. You know, when I came to Florida uh, it's almost 37 years ago, I hardly ever got an opportunity to speak to a group of more than about five or six people about Native Plants and Wildlife. You've probably heard my talk a million times if you know me at all. <coughs> and you go online now on Facebook or something and there's probably three dozen groups in Florida that are devoted to native plants and pollinators, or native plants and birds, or native plants because they're cool, or all kinds of gardening with native plants. It's, we're getting to this point, I think we're acknowledging that native plants are an important component to creating a restoration of the landscapes we've damaged up to this point in time. As Richard said, I guess the British have finally come to terms with it. I like to believe that. I know that all over Europe and places they are looking to restore landscapes and because of that, the wildlife that are such an important uh, component to that. And so, it's a reflection on our land and our knowledge of the land, we have to understand that. Because we're not going to restore anything without tying it to other things. So, food sovereignty movement has become a big deal. You're probably aware of that thing, this whole idea of um, traditional agriculture providing uh, food sovereignty, our ability to maintain our connection to food production. And part of her writing speaks to that thing, and I wanted to just touch base with some of these things. Those last three points, people have forgotten that plants were once regarded as our oldest teachers. What a great line. We can learn so much from plants. Now, as Richard's telling me how many, and us, how many listed wildlife species are, that's always the top of the list. Thank you, Richard, for also including the plant part at the bottom, because as a wildlife biologist, you know, people think I'm a botanist. If you think I'm a botanist, you're wrong. <laughs> because I do have my degrees in wildlife, but I used to catch crap. I can say that better than the other word. 
because, and I hear it from faculty, why do you spend so much time with plants, Craig? Because you can't understand why wildlife are where they are if you don't understand plants. If you don't understand how plant communities are designed and what, com what are the components of an intact system and why it provides habitat for a scrub jay here, but it doesn't over there. If we don't understand plants and how they work, we don't understand anything in terms of our ability to restore systems or restore life in our landscape. If we can plant native plants, I've done it for years. You go outside and what a great collection of plants those folks have, and they get better every year. It's so encouraging. When I first came to Florida, I had to drive to the Florida Keys. This woman named Donna Spront who ran this thing called Florida Keys Native Nursery to get a white stopper. Oh my God, everybody knows white stopper now. You know, we are getting to the point where things are available. The big rub against the native plant movement that I can't find those plants anywhere is disappearing rapidly as folks like the folks outside are making these available to us. But if we don't understand how they fit into a system, we don't understand them, we don't think of them as teachers. When we go walking through the woods or wherever we go walking, we have missing part of the really important part of that equation if we're going to restore our landscape in some semblance to provide maximum benefit for wildlife. If you ever follow anything I put on Facebook, you know that I'm not the world's biggest fan of Biden's all, but I'm sorry for all of you that love it. Why? It grows everywhere on every roadside. It grows across the street for me. It grows throughout my neighbor's lawn. I don't need more of it in my landscape, but if I put it and if you see where it grows, that's where it grows. If I put it in my wildflower meadow in a year, all I've got is Biden's all because it's grown over the top of everything else, and all of a sudden I have no diversity, and it's not a natural system at all. Butterflies will use it, and bees will use it, but that's not the idea. It's The idea is to create diversity in a community within my landscape. If I don't do that, I have not gotten to where I need to go. And we are in this point in time where if we don't maximize what we do personally, who else is going to do it? It's critical for us to make our landscapes as good as possible. Not just a collection of plants. Not plants because they're cute and I like them, but plants because they have a role that we need to provide in our landscape because that role isn't being done by somebody else. So, Three kinds of knowledge, and I'll go through that relatively quick, I think. This indigenous wisdom that Robin is able to have, you know, I think I went to graduate school with Robin, but I didn't know her. I took a lot of botany class, and there's a woman in one of my botany class pictures that looks just like her if she was 25 years old. It's like, I'd love to talk to her sometime. But she has this unique ability because she is connected to Native America and a PhD and a hell of, of a communicator to be able to tie things together in a way most people like me can't do. There is this certain indigenous wisdom, understanding plants as things, as beings, not just as its. But the scientific knowledge that has to come with what we're doing, or coming from somebody that knows what they're doing that we pay attention to, you know, there's no one in this audience today, but we're living in a society where being a scientist and having data is really kind of passe, because I know more than you do. I don't care what you say. I read it on Facebook. I saw a YouTube video, and, and I know more about it than you do. We have to trust the scientific wisdom that is there, that is constantly developing. We got people like Jared back there that are studying things that we need to know if we're going to save certain butterflies from South Florida and understand how they fit in that system. And of course, the knowledge of the plants themselves. So, so much of us look at this idea that human life is essentially uh, a struggle against this hostile environment, right? I mean, all the settlers are, and all the stories I learned when I was uh, being educated in Wisconsin, thank God I'm not being educated in Florida right now, um, <laughs> this struggle as we move across this hostile land that's 
basically unpopulated by real human beings. It's like, Jesus, these people have been living here for how many thousands of years and they're connected to this place and it's not hostile to them. It's part of their life. They're part of the system. But we have so often looked at our need to tame something. And that's why we are where we are right now. These kinds of landscapes that Richard described, this sea of grass that shows that I'm wealthy enough to have a lawn and a gardener and they can mow it for me. I can only imagine what it looked like when those first ships landed or those first people moved west across the Great Plains and saw the unbelievable diversity that prairie has. You know, if you haven't been to a prairie, you've got Kissimmee here. What an amazing place Kissimmee Prairie State Preserve is. And that's just a small piece of prairie and down in Florida, we go to the Midwest where it was all turned into corn and bean fields, but go to the National Park in Nebraska that still has intact prairie, and you would imagine, you know, mountain lions, they're not mountain lions, they are uh, big cats that lived across all kinds of ecosystems that have been pushed to the top of mountains because there's no place left for them to be. You know, elk and wolves and all kinds of things living in a bear, living in this system of unbelievable plant diversity. It wasn't a hostile environment. It was really difficult to plow it up and turn it into a bean field like it is now. If you live in Iowa like I did for five years, Janie and I both lived in Iowa when we went to uh, our last bit of schooling and uh, you know, the remnant prairie there is along a railroad track that they didn't plow up as they laid the tracks, and it's about as wide as this podium on both sides, and there's things in there. It's like, oh my God, we got to save this orchid. You come to Florida, and there's 25% of the state that's still been protected, preserved, and hopefully most of it being managed pretty well, even though the funds aren't always there. The people that manage these state and federal systems are unbelievably dedicated people. We have this. We can see what Florida looked like in so many places. And so what Kimmer does so well in braiding sweetgrass amongst all the other things she did is your only role is to be open, eyed, and present. And that's really the indigenous part of this whole thing, is to see what's in front of you and to be open to it. You know, I teach, have taught, I'm not currently a professor, um, so many students. And you know, my students in their 20s, and much like so many people I meet that are my age, <coughs> there's a couple that are older than me still, and people that are younger, you know, you walk down the street and it's just green. You know, we don't see what's in front of us. John Muir did not get a PhD. So many of the world's greatest naturalists do not have higher education. The difference is they see what's in front of their face and they're quizzical about it. They think about it. They try to learn from what they see in front of us. And I think that really is what this whole indigenous wisdom amounts to is seeing it for what it is questioning it, understanding it to the best of our ability. So, gratitude is a big part of it, and I'm not going to beat this any more in depth than I already have. It shows respect for what's given, and I think that's the important thing, is we show respect for what is out there. It's not this concept that it was put there for us to use by somebody. It doesn't really matter if it goes extinct because it was there for us to use it and it's gone. Well, we'll use something else. And that's been going on for a long, long time. The moa birds in, in uh, New Zealand have all disappeared and the dodos disappeared and all kinds of really large mammals on this uh, continent disappeared. How much would that do with overhunting or overuse? I don't know. I suspect some of it was. And Again, I'm not going to read this. I'll let you read it if you care to. It's really, what would it be like to be raised on 
gratitude. What would that do to change our whole perspective on this whole thing? You know, the idea of things being interrelated and working together is this whole uh, agricultural concept that so many indigenous, you know, agricultural uh, nations use of planting beans and corn squashed together for a purpose. Scientific knowledge. You know, her ability as, a, as an educated PhD botanist to be able to look at plants from a scientific standpoint gives her a whole other perspective that is important. And I'm not going to dwell on that any more than I really have right now. Land degradation is one of our most pressing ecological challenges. And I think the rest of that says what it has to say. We're living in a world of unprecedented change. You don't have to live in Florida or anywhere else for any length of time to see that the world is changing around us, the climate is changing around us, the number of species, plants and animals that are being added to lists instead of being deleted are increasing over time at a rate I can't imagine. This whole business that we're living in this time, and we have the data, we're collecting the data, it's there for us to understand and see. We can't deny it if we understand the importance of science into this equation. So then what do we do as educated human beings? We use that data to do something about it. The decade of ecosystem restoration, wouldn't that be great if this really was? And it could, but it's all up to us too, because we can't rely on government to do everything. And sometimes we can't rely on government to do anything. <laughs> but we do know that we have power over the property that we have management authority of. If it's our condo porch uh, that's on a balcony, whether it's 10 acres somewhere that you're fortunate enough to have land to spread out in, but we know we have management ability there and what we do there is important. We can never lapse into the idea that what we are doing here is not important because one person who doesn't really have a big impact that's never going to be true it's never been true and right now it's not true especially and this i think has a lot to say so i will read at least a little of this it may not be easy but we need to ask ourselves if we're creating design centers to earn an income to make ourselves known in our profession if we're landscaping in any way, shape, or form, or if we're creating an odd respect or reverence for life on this planet. And I do know that so much landscape designing is done for aesthetics. Who in the hell ever decided that a crow was aesthetic? <laughs> what does it do? It's got leaves. And, you know, I pick up crows every time, so I apologize one more time. <laughs> You know, I could paint my window with pictures of crotons on it and it would look the same every day or I could look out the window and my crotons would still look the same every day. They aren't providing any habitat value of anything that I'm aware of. We need to design not on aesthetics. That doesn't mean our landscapes are homely to us. And sometimes they're beautiful to us and maybe a little homely to our neighbors that don't understand what we're doing. Or we can make landscapes that are aesthetically interesting. Or we choose plants for the value they've got. This is one of the books I wrote. And the reason I wrote this book that ties in the end is our understanding of plants. Because we have to understand the plants themselves. How they do what they do. Why they do what they do. If you go, and I'm not trying to sell this book to you, so <laughs> you can buy it, it's great. <laughs> but you go, so many people, maybe no one in this room, but I know I'm outside and I'm buying plants for the USF Botanical Garden, but I like to believe I know what that plant is going to do with my landscape out there and why adding it would be an educational thing that isn't available with everything else I've done to this point. But so many people go past a plant that looks cute and they buy it, you know? Oh, you have no idea what it's going to do. How big is it going to be? What kind of growing conditions? What is it going to do in my life? Is it going to provide food for birds? Is it going to be a nesting source? What is it going to do? You wouldn't do that with a pet. At least I hope you would. Don't tell me if you do. If you get a dog, 
you probably get a dog knowing what to expect and you're ready for it when you bring it home. You've got food and a place to take care of it. You probably wind up a vet if it gets sick. You know where you're going to take it. And I don't care if you get a chameleon, a Vietnamese mossy frog, a St. Bernard, whatever it is. We buy animals as pets usually knowing what we're getting. And so many times we buy plants not knowing anything about what it's going to do except it's cool. <laughs> It's got a pretty flower. It's got this or that. We can't landscape that way if we're going to be effective. Designing for reciprocity. And that's this whole program. And I'm not going to read these either because I bet I've talked as long as my time allows. I'm not looking at my watch. But go through this because it'll be posted. There's these principles. But basically what it's saying is we prioritize our design, the plants we choose, on the impact of the community, and not for its ability to make a pleasing look to something. Solutions of these types are basically looking at designing our landscapes to be part of the living world. Designs need to switch from aesthetics to function. This other book that I've got out there that I did with UF Press is designed with trees and shrubs primarily to tell you what a plant does. Because you're not going to buy that marlberry out there, I hope, not knowing how big it's going to be and what growing conditions and what it'll provide and why it's different than a Mercedes, which looks kind of the same, but it's a very different kind of plant. And there's not a bird in the world going to nest in your marlberry shrub, I don't think. It doesn't have those kind of branches. But it does provide a whole lot of other things. What do I need in my landscape? What is it that's missing? What do I already have? And we choose plants on their attributes is, I think, the biggest message of this last little bit that I want to leave you with. You need to know what it's going to do. Choose plants based on their attributes. If we're going to create sustainable landscapes, and if we're going to create something that's reciprocal and the word to the rest of the world, then we have to look at attributes. We have to know what they are. We have to be able to evaluate. You don't need me to come to your yard and say, ooh, you don't have this. It's really not that hard. My neighbor has three live oaks. Why would I plant a live oak in my yard? I do not care what Dr. Tellamy says about the value of live oaks. I don't need one. If I put one in, it creates shade that's going to block out my ability to plant about a hundred other plants that need more sun. I've all of a sudden tied up my yard with a live oak. Live oak's not a bad plant, but I don't need one. It's in my backyard, right over the fence. That bird has no idea that that's not my live oak. <laughs> I think sometimes we view our landscape like the wildlife are thanking us. But what it should be is the other way around. Our landscape should be thanking them. And so I don't need a live book. I don't need a red cedar. What a great plant. Something just happened. There's three of them in my neighborhood, really close to where I live. I don't need to tie up my yard with a red cedar. And it's also a host for cedar apple rust. And I like hawthorns. And I don't want a red cedar next to my hawthorns, just in case. I start to get that being passed back around because to me, my hawthorns are eight times more valuable than that red cedar in my neighbor's yard. Attributes. And we need to think about them as communities and not collections. You know, I've made this mistake most of my life in landscaping, looking at my landscape like it's a collection of plants. I got one of these, I got one of these. I don't have one of these. I should add one of those. That's a really cool plant. I really like Jamaican caper. I don't know why they came to my head, but I do. So I should add a Jamaican caper because I don't have one. Why would I? There's a lot of reasons why. And I've planted one lots of places because I think it's a great plant. But you know, it's not because I don't have one in my collection. And so many of us in the native plant movement, I think, are still caught in this art syndrome that I call it anyhow, where we're going to save one or two of everything, you know? It might be endangered elsewhere, but I'm going to have one in my yard, and when uh, it's a fan, there's going to be one left. This is my yard, and I'm going to save the species. No, that's not what we're doing. We're creating communities, even if it's not natural. And that's 
the flip side. There are so many people in the native plant movement that want to say, my yard needs to be a pine flatwoods, and I need to plant a pine flatwoods in my yard. Well, that's just BS. <laughs> it's BS partly because your yard, unless it's really a pine flatwoods, is never going to have all the abiotic factors that a pine flatwoods will have. It won't have that hydrology. It won't have the burn frequency. It won't have all those other things. It'll be a picture of a pine flatwoods. It'll look like one, but it won't really work like one. We can create communities in our yard that are comprised of plants that don't naturally occur together, but we have to understand that they work together. They're part of a family. We've created this thing, and so all the little parts we plant are important, and that's why diversity is such an important part to what we do. In a community, plants support each other, and then that goes beyond, and it supports more than one plus one equals two. If we've done the right thing and picked the plants that have the attributes we need, that work together, that don't need a lot of supplemental anything, but function and provide services throughout the year to the extent that they can, we've created a community, not a collection. That kind of overexposed thing on the right is rouge plant. If you've ever grown rouge plant, you know that First of all, if it's in too much shade, it gets really stringy, stringy and then it dies. It does not last well. Put it in too much sun, it bleaches out and dies. If you put it in the right place, it gets really dense. And then it's got cover. It always had food. It always has nectar for bees and butterflies. But if you plant one, because you've got this collection of plants and you want one of these and a scorpion tail and a, and a this and a that as all your ground covers, it's not going to ever function as part of a system. And that on the right is the Alpine Holly and Chickasaw Plum growing together in some giant mass. But, you know, functioning that way provides a thicket in the winter and the rest of the year, actually, that provides food and cover for almost year-round because the Alpines are evergreen, Chickasaws aren't, but they flower at a different time. And those two things function together make this great thing that would never happen by themselves. That is part of my old front yard. The community doesn't have to be natural, I've already said that. We don't have to recreate a natural system. I've always lived in a suburban landscape with a quarter acre <coughs> plot or whatever the standard size is. People say, well, there's a picture in one of my books that's actually miscaptioned, it's in a state park, and people go, God, is that your yard? It's like, no, it's not, it's not my yard at all. I wish my yard looked like that. But even in a small quarter acre lot, can do so many things. And it doesn't have to be everything that grows together naturally. It has to be things that work together as a community to provide what is needed. And what is needed is food, water, and cover. And it needs to do that for everything that's practical and possible. You can't just create a bird garden because it won't be habitat for everything else. It might not be good habitat. You can't just have a butterfly garden. And as Jared, I'm sure, will speak, you know, half the butterfly host plants in my landscapes are trees and shrubs, so it's certainly not that it's just this wildflower patch that I somehow go out in the morning with a can of seeds and sprinkle on bare dirt and walk away, and I've got that, you know, geez, those people drive me crazy. I'm sorry if you're one of them. <laughs> Jane gets upset with me because I pick on them sometimes privately to her. It's like, but you can't, it's not easy. If what we're going to do is what I'm suggesting and, and uh, hoping that we all do is difficult work. It takes weeding, it takes thought, it takes planning, it takes time, it takes all kinds of things we have to be willing to do if we're going to be the people that are restoring the landscape whether it's our yard, our business, around this center, wherever it happens to be. There are <coughs> lots, as I've said, anthropomorphic reasons. I've used those for so many years when I give this talk. It's good for us. It's good for your house. It brings you joy. You take your kids out there and they're educated about things. That's all true. But we don't do it for that. The best reason is because of reciprocity. The fact that we are restoring things with an understanding that we really are part of nature. We want to be part of that fabric of life 
not this thing that sits outside of it, that somehow directs how things go, but a joyful uh, component, part of a system. And thank you very much.